Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar on county redistricting and weighted voting systems. My name is Mark Levine and I am the deputy director of your New York State Association of Counties. On behalf of our president, Marty Sauerbrei, and our executive director, Stephen Aquario, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to participate in this important webinar. NISAC has been fielding a number of questions over the last few weeks about redistricting and weighted voting, and we thought the best thing to do would be to get a couple of, uh, of experts in the field that we work with and that work with our counties to come on and talk about this in a webinar. So we are very pleased to have our presenters here with us today. But before we get started, I want to say that NISAC does not have a position on redistricting and, and weighted voting. Instead, we understand that the counties, the counties are in the best positions to determine the best ways to govern their local governments or their governments and, and organize their governments. So I want, just wanted to say that before we get started. Next slide, Jeanette. NISAC thanks our sponsor of today's webinar, NTS Data Service LLC. The New York State NTS Data Services works in close partnership with 51 counties and over 70 school districts across the Empire State to develop and apply election technology applications. These applications include voter database solutions and cybersecurity expertise to aid our counties and school districts in securing their critical data from adversarial entities. And we have a, a video to, that talks about NTS and the solutions that they are providing counties and school districts. Jeanette? Hello, and thank you for attending today's NISAC event. This is Sam with NTS Data Services, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about our new geo redistricting functionality. Geo redistricting allows you to take a shape file like the one seen below and redistrict your entire county. Whether it's congressional lines, assembly lines, or legislative lines, they're all done in a snap. All you have to do is open NTS Suite, go into redistricting, import your shapefile, click on save. It's super fast, super easy, and most importantly, super accurate. If you wanna learn more, give us a call. Sign up for our next Geo Redistricting Zoom session. Thank you. Now we have some housekeeping announcements. Uh, Jeanette, uh, do you want to let the participants know how they, they, they can actively participate in this morning's webinar? Yes, good morning, everyone. I want to tell you that we will be recording this program and posting it with a PDF of the slides on NYSEC's website under education and then under webinars. Just look for today's date. We will also be posting a PDF of the slide deck we encourage you to submit questions throughout the program. We ask you to refer to your dashboard, click on the questions tab, type in your question at any time during the presentation, and we will get to your questions at the end of the program during the Q&A. Back to you, Mark. Thank you. That's Jeanette Stanziano, our Director of Training and Education at the New York State Association of Counties. She'll be, she has organized this webinar and will be running the slides. Thank you, Jeanette, very much. Our speakers today are Gerald Benjamin of the Benjamin Center. Uh, he's the Benjamin Center Emeritus Founding Director. Jerry joined the New Pulse faculty as an Assistant Professor of Political Science in 1968 and, and achieved the university's highest rank in 2002, when he was appointed as a distinguished professor by the SUNY Board of Trustees. 
He served as chair of the Department of Political Science, presiding officer of the faculty and dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences from 1996 and 2008. And we were talking before this webinar about all that he has seen. He, he was uh, um, in college when the decision for one person, one vote came down uh, and, and he has been involved in every redistricting effort since then. Uh, and the development of, of county legislatures from the boards of supervisors uh, positions. So it's really an honor to have uh, Jerry with us today. Our second speaker is also from the Benjamin Center, and that's Josh Simons. He's the senior research associate. He specializes in geographic information systems, redistricting, shared service analysis, and data visualization. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from SUNY New Paltz magna cum laude 2008 and a master of p and master of public administration degree from maris college and he is a member of the phi pi alpha alpha honor society his recent projects include the creation of charts and diagrams for the orange county citizens foundation 2015 report card the creation of an online interactive map and website to display information about vacant properties in the city of Newburgh. And he is currently working on the creation of an online interactive map for the greater walkway experience and is a consultant for the city of Poughkeepsie Charter Reform Commission. Josh is also working with a number of counties on their redistricting efforts this year. Finally, uh, if he can join us, because uh, he's uh, uh, on the subway right now heading to the law school is Jeff Weiss. He's the adjunct professor and senior fellow at New York Law School. Jeff is an adjunct professor and senior fellow where he directs the New York Census and Redistricting Institute. He is now working on his fifth redistricting cycle. In past years, he served as redistricting counsel to five state assembly speakers and four state Senate Democratic leaders. He currently serves as counsel to Assemblyman Robert Rodriguez, the assembly's lat four chair, and he is the co-editor and author of the National Conference of State Legislature's recently published 2020 Redistricting Red Book. It's a, again, it's a pleasure to have these distinguished uh, presenters with us today. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Jerry Benjamin. I'm delighted actually to be here with you as it, my association with counties reaches back to the 70s and 80s when I held an elected office in Ulster County and, and later became head of the county government, county legislature. It was on the board of NYSEC. NYSEC is a very important organization in advancing the interests of county governments and educating its members on uh, the issues they face and potential remedies to problems that uh, have, a, have a particular county-based perspective and locally centered and, and with solutions locally generated. I'm going to be talking about a little bit about weighted voting, a, a, a topic not always discussed when we talk about uh, the required, the, re, the requirements of federal law regarding fair representation. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. So if you have questions, just note them and I'll try to answer them uh, when the time provides. So we date back to 1962 and actually right when I was in college, when the Supreme Court decided that the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution required legislative districts to be substantially equal in population. Litigation on this reaches back to the 40s, and the court usually repaired to a political question doctrine, which said that they could not act on matters of uh, like this that required the political institutions of states to find remedies. But the court switched this position in uh, Baker versus Carr, and then a series of cases indicated here. We, this comes to your doorstep because in 1968, the idea of substantially equal population was applied to local governments in the, in the case of Avery versus Midland County. So you are governed by this decision and it's uh, and following decisions having to do with one person, one vote. Next slide, please. You probably all know this, but I thought for the purposes of uh, context, we remember that counties were governed by boards of supervisors, almost all counties were governed by boards of supervisors in uh, 
the 19th century and the evolution to other forms was the late 19th and early and early mid 20th century phenomenon. So boards were then as now comprised of supervisors of each of the towns in the county augmented by elect, additional supervisors elected from wards within each city, if any, in the county. So this was the established mode of governance. Towns were, within counties were, of course, not equal in population. They weren't established in that manner. They were established in accord to 19th century criteria having to do with uh, petitioning the state government, travel time, uh, issues about county seat location and so on. And uh, they found themselves therefore out of, immediately out of compliance with uh, one person, one vote under the US Constitution. By the way, there's still residuals of this in operating law, the relationship between towns and counties is a very interesting matter and uh, the dangers I'll wander off into that topic. So keep me, keep me under, under check. Two major alternative approaches were developed in complying with one person, one, one vote. Counties would give up could give up towns as the basis of their governance structure. Replace uh, boards of legislative boards of uh, supervisors with legislators. Create single member districts that were substantially equal in population, or combine towns and use single and multi member districts to assure that citizens were equally represented. Now understand that uh, the Supreme Court gave greater leeway to local government in being less than fully uh, equal in its districts being less than fully equal in population, because they regarded uh, it as healthy and purposeful to uh, and desirable for, to give consideration to ex existing boundaries and communities of interest. This requires periodically altering the size of the legislative body as a possibility, or as it turns out, the votes that each legislator casts. Counties could retain the board and maintain towns as integral to county government, create a weighted voting system that equally represented citizens by giving supervisors different voting strength within the board. Many of you are familiar with this based upon the town size, population size relative to that of other towns in the county. So weighted voting uh, is essentially a, a technique used to, to preserve town governments as units in the county, as, as structural units in the county government. It has lots of merits especially in, in uh, rural areas. People are, are most loyal to and most familiar with their town governments. Additionally, it creates a strong link between towns and counties in their operation. And we can talk about the merits of the, of the weighted voting scheme, uh, which permits uh, boards of supervisors to continue to operate in another conversation. Next slide, please. According to my count, there are 57 counties outside New York City. I'm sure of that, but within the city. 16 are governed by boards of supervisors. 41 have county legislatures. <coughs> now, legislatures aren't restricted to single member districts. They can have multi-member districts, as some of you know from experience. All the counties must consider redistrict if redistricting is needed and redistrict if necessary. So you have to go through the process of checking whether your current system is in compliance after the census. You may discover you don't have to change anything, in which case you can put that on the record and be recorded as having checked it and being satisfied that uh, federal law, one person, one vote, is, is, is you're in compliance with that requirement. Next slide, please. So I looked at Columbia County as I'm, it's somewhat proximate to Ulster County. I know a little, I visited now and then and I talked to the County, county board from time to time about issues facing, issues of government organization facing the county. There may be somebody from Columbia County uh, listening or watching, and if so, and I've got it wrong, please tell me so I can fix it. So I counted 18 town supervisors, five supervisors elected from the city of Hudson, total number of members, 23. Right now, those 23 members cast 3,535 3, uh, weighted votes. They have a po the county has a full population of 58,813 under the census. Most legislative votes are casted, cast by the Kinderhook supervisor, 442, 12.5% of the population. No, 12.5% of the weighted votes, 13.7% of the population. 
The least votes are cast by each of the uh, legislators, elect, each of the supervisors elected, forgive me for my error, supervisor elected from wards in the city of Hudson, 74 votes. And the uh, ward populations are uh, 2.5% of uh, each ward population, 2.5% of county population. And tag panic, single 10 with a single supervisor cast almost the same votes as the ward in the city of Beacon with a population of uh, 1,231. So uh, you see that, uh, and you know that weighted vote, the weighted vote cast by each member is uh, relative to the size of its population in part, in part, that's the critical point. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now, if you allocate weights to representatives entirely in proportion to population, you may exclude some towns entirely from effective participation in governance. It's simple to see this and uh, roughly descriptive of the case in Nassau County before they adopted a legislative system. If one town has more than half the county's people, it renders could render all the other towns irrelevant. It can have a, it have a majority of the votes if the votes were allocated according to population and do whatever it wanted. From, politically, it probably wouldn't do that, but it could. So there's a flaw in the proportional uh, distribution of uh, votes, the direct proportional distribution of population. Next slide, please. So it's not sufficient to weigh, according to the decision by Iannucci versus Board of Supervisors of Washington County, by the New York State Court of Appeals in 1967, it's not sufficient to weigh relative to the percent of population represented. Weight has to be in accord with voting power, which is defined as the percentage of time representatives may comprise a part of a potential winning coalition. The Banzef Index is named after a professor who uh, demonstrated the flaw, or demonstrated again the flaw, uh, drawing upon previous research by others, a proportional distribution of, voting, of, of votes entirely based on population. I'm, I added a link that I'm not going to, it's a very didactic link on how you calculate the Banzhaf index. For those who want to take a look at that, it's, the link is provided. Now, remember that uh, there's a lot of issues with uh, weighted voting and there have been lots of legal challenges. It's been upheld, the practice has been upheld in both uh, federal and state courts. And so from a pure notion of representation, we can discuss on that again at another time, whether, whether, for example, all of representation has to do with voting, which of course it doesn't have to do. So that uh, raises, raised challenges from some about the validity of using weighted voting. But they've all, but these challenges have, the, the systems have survived the challenges. I was directly involved in one having to do, in New York City, having to do with the uh, Board of Estimate of the city and the redesign of its uh, charter in the mid 80s. <coughs> Excuse me, next slide, please. So first, you have to figure out what the weight would be if, if you use population only. Then you have to determine the number of winning coalitions which may occur under this uh, condition. And then you find out how essential each legislator is with his or her weight, weighted vote to the winning coalition. And you adjust the, winning co the, the weights so as to assure that the legislators with the least votes have a chance to be in winning coalitions in proportion to the amount of the number of times proportional to the amount of population in their jurisdiction. This is a formulaic practice uh, that you have a um, kind of mathematical exercise that you have that, that you go through to determine if you conformance with one person, one vote under your weight from your weighted voting system and adjust it if you must. Next slide, please. So uh, the reason, the essential reason to sum up before we compare to Jeff, 
to stick with weighted voting is that you keep your town central to the governance of the county. And uh, over time, because it seems to be the norm now, counties that have weighted voting and, and boards of supervisors consider alternatives. Those debates bring up the strengths and weaknesses of the system with regard to uh, um, its design and its responsiveness and its effectiveness. Those are other questions. But this is a way of keeping this system in place. And it was actually the first or second example in American government of formulaic criteria being adopted by courts and applies to practical questions, which is interesting to social scientists, at least, if not others. Thank you for your attention. I'll stand by for your question. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Great uh, presentation, and um, I look forward to the Q&A afterwards. And I remind attendees on this webinar uh, uh, presentation that at the end of um, the presentations, we will take your questions one at a time. So if you have them throughout, or if you if if something uh, some part of the presentation uh, um, uh, triggers a question in you, you can write it at any point in the questions tab. I'd like to now turn it over to Jeff Weiss from New York Law School. Jeff. Jeff, we just need you to unmute your mic. Okay, um, am I audible now? Can anybody hear me? Yes, yes you are. Can. Okay, can I, I see my slides, I don't see the video. I don't know if you can see me, and I, again, my apologies for uh, the uh, lateness. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to uh, talk about the new state law that uh, will uh, uh, provide criteria for all counties to uh, follow for redistricting. Now, the basic um, legal uh, premises for uh, redistricting include equal population, uh, one person, one vote, uh, that each district should be basically equally populous to all other districts. Um, we also have the Federal Voting Rights Act. Uh, the Voting Rights Act uh, becomes a factor when we have significantly high levels of racially polarized voting and uh, situations where minority uh, supported candidates cannot elect their preferred candidates of choice. Uh, we've recently seen action uh, under the Voting Rights Act in Suffolk County and in um, Rockland County. Uh, we have the uh, third, the municipal home rule law. We have county charters. And now to add to the mix, we have uh, chapter 516 uh, that Governor Hochul signed into law about two weeks ago. And I'll spend most of my time uh, discussing the new law. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I just mentioned uh, the Voting Rights Act. We've had situations in Rockland County where the East Ramapo School Board uh, was found to have violated the Federal Voting Rights Act because no Hispanic candidate uh, had been able to a uh, Hispanic preferred candidate had been able to elect a preferred candidate uh, for school board elections. And last year, uh, a federal district court judge uh, found the school board in violation of uh, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And uh, moving forward, the school board is going to be required to create a new scheme to uh, allow for the election of a Hispanic preferred candidate. Uh, similarly, in Suffolk County last year, uh, in the case of Flores versus Town of Islip, uh, a federal district court judge uh, approved a consent decree between Hispanic plaintiffs and the, um, the township. Uh, Islip had been um, 
electing five at-large town board members. Uh, over the last 50, 60 years, the Hispanic population in uh, one part of Islip Township, uh, the northwest corner, uh, the Hispanic population increased dramatically uh, and no Hispanic candidate had ever been elected. In fact, no one from that part of the township had ever been elected. So the town decided to settle rather than continue a, a lengthy and expensive uh, multi-million dollar trial. And uh, the federal judge ordered that of the five districts, one district uh, be drawn to uh, permit the Hispanic community in the Brentwood area and Central Islip to be able to elect their preferred candidate of choice. And in fact, last week, an Hispanic candidate using the new plan was elected. And this follows a similar uh, case from Nassau County uh, about 20 some odd years ago, uh, where the town of Hempstead was required to create at least one uh, minority district where the black community uh, could elect this preferred candidate. Uh, next slide. So just dip, digging a little deeper on uh, the criteria, uh, under current law, the Municipal Home Rule uh, Law Section 10, uh, this requires all, uh, the, uh, all of the uh, non-charter counties to follow population equality, uh, that no towns except those comprising 110% of a district population can be divided. Uh, it also calls for providing fair and effective representation for the people of the local government as organized in political parties. This is language from state law. And also the district shall be of convenient and contiguous territory as in, in a compact form as is practicable. This has been the current law and uh, counties that had uh, charters uh, often had their own criteria, which were um, often different. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, Assemblywoman Amy Paulin from uh, Westchester County and uh, Senator Jim Scoufis, Scoufis from the, the Hudson Valley uh, introduced legislation to create criteria for all counties, specifically for uh, charter counties. But the background in it is that in 1991, uh, the Westchester County League of Women Voters challenged the county's legislative redistricting plan because it didn't follow the state guidelines. Uh, the appellate division held that the county operates under a charter form of government and its reapportionment plans are adopted pursuant to its charter, not the municipal home rule law. Uh, so charter counties were not required to follow the MHRL standards. And uh, the, now the, uh, the bill, which was um, A229C and S5160B, uh, the governor signed it, and now uh, it's Chapter 516 of the Laws of 2021. And this extends the um, municipal home rule law guidelines to cover charter counties so that statutory provisions for uh, electoral procedures and redistricting would be uniformly applied uh, in every county in New York State. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the, uh, I'll go through the, the new criteria that all counties now have to follow. Uh, first off, if you have single member uh, county legislative districts, the population equality uh, must be as near as practicable within 5%. Uh, that means that the size of the largest to the size of the smallest district has to fall within 5%. That could be plus three minus two, uh, plus two and a half, minus two and a half. Uh, but whereas uh, in prior decades, uh, you were allowed a, a difference or a deviation as we call it within uh, overall a bubble of 10% uh, the state of New York has narrowed that down to 5%. Uh, if you have multi-member uh, county uh, boards or legislatures, then the uh, population equality uh, has to be uh, substantially equally weighted uh, from district to district. Uh, the other criteria include uh, uh, prohibiting plans that intend to or result in denying or abridging minority voting rights. <clears throat> and, that, and, and that can go different ways depending on whether you have uh, a possible Voting Rights Act violation or if you're simply looking to uh, join together 
uh, communities of interest uh, made up of heavily uh, black, Asian, or Hispanic communities. Uh, districts must be contiguous. Uh, districts must be compact. Uh, by contiguity, we mean that you have to be able to go from one part of the district to another part of the district and uh, basically not leave the district or uh, in all likelihood not draw districts that are contiguous only at a low tide as we've seen some of our state legislative districts throughout the last few decades. Uh, districts must be compact. Uh, there's no exact definition for compactness, but there are mathematical models that courts have looked to that gauge the level of compactness, uh, one plan versus another. Uh, also, the plans cannot favor or disfavor incumbents, particular candidates, or political parties. Uh, plans should also consider existing uh, district cores, political subdivisions, uh, and communities of interests. Uh, also, no villages, cities, or towns except those having 40% of a full ratio or a full district uh, can be divided. That's primarily to um, you know, avoid splitting small communities. And also districts must be formed so as to promote the orderly and efficient, and efficient elections, uh, essentially meaning that you should not enact a plan on March 1st and expect that the boards of elections can administer them and begin a petitioning process the next day. You should, allow for a you know, two, three week um, window between enacting a plan and uh, beginning the election process using the new, new lines. Uh, these criteria are also ranked uh, and that avoids uh, having to deal with trade-offs. You know, the New York State Commission is now redrawing state Senate assembly and congressional lines with very similar criteria, but they're not ranked. And by ranking criteria, uh, it means that you, uh, you know, follow in order population equality, uh, minority voting rights, contiguity, compactness, so forth and so on, so that, uh, you know, at some point you can't uh, accommodate all of these criteria, but the higher ranked criteria uh, receive priority. Uh, this is something that I've worked with in the New York City uh, Council redistricting, where we have ranked criteria and as long as you accommodate the top criteria that you might not be able to uh, effectively deal with the lower criteria. And that especially comes into place where there might be a prohibition on splitting uh, uh, localities. But if you deal with the top ones, you may end up having to split a locality because the, uh, the, you know, the, the population equality or other factors require that. Uh, next slide. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about uh, communities of interest because this is the uh, the fastest growing, uh, most used criteria that public interest groups, good government groups, and the voting rights community are looking to to draw districts. Uh, communities of interest are essentially self-defined. Uh, they're usually uh, socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, medical, academic. Uh, you find uh, arguments and reasons why your community uh, should be joined with other like-minded uh, constituencies and you attempt to draw districts based on drawing communities of interest together. Uh, interestingly, there are even new software programs, free software programs with instruction and data that help community organizers uh, identify, develop uh, communities of interest to send to redistricting uh, you know, committees. Uh, one thing that communities of interest could lead to could be strangely shaped districts. Uh, and you need to always be mindful when you're drawing districts uh, for communities of color that you don't draw exaggerated strange shapes because the courts have said that if you draw districts based on race and race alone, and it might end up in a somewhat uh, questionable um, shape, that could raise constitutional questions under the 14th Amendment. Uh, I'd be glad to discuss that more in depth. It can take all day to discuss communities of interest, the Voting Rights Act, uh, the 14th Amendment, uh, but uh, it's something that you're going to be facing in the coming year, and uh, you have to also uh, begin thinking of whether communities of interest should be kept together, or do you want to follow the traditional uh, boundaries of your towns and villages, uh, your hamlets that are you know, more uh, understandably recognized and used over the 
past few decades. Uh, next slide. Okay, so just to touch a little bit more, uh, if you, you want to avoid packing when you're creating communities of interest districts, if, and this is you know, always being uh, done on a case by case, district specific basis, but if you are drawing a district that the Voting Rights Act might require, then you have to find the level, the number of uh, minority voters necessary to uh, help uh, to lead to the election of the minority community favored candidate. But if you draw districts that, let's say, if you need 52% to create a minority district, and then you pack that district to, let's say, 60%, because wow. you're adding minority communities to that, uh, that could be a problem. So you need to balance uh, communities of interest and also shapes and population numbers. Uh, so you want to avoid using race as a predominant factor. However, and this is another rule of thumb, if you have a minority community that is naturally occurring, it's square, it's rectangular, it's compact, it's okay and reasonable to draw that as a district. It depends on the geography and the numbers. And again, it's uh, on a district specific basis. And if you're ever not sure where you have a significant uh, minority community uh, where the minority uh, population can comprise at least 50% of an ideal district population, that's 50% of the minority voting age population, then you'll want to engage an expert to do racial block voting analysis uh, so that you could be directly on target as to what your situation is and what you need to do. Uh, next slide. Okay, well, that's uh, uh, my presentation and my contact information. Uh, I've been working with uh, with Jerry Benjamin and uh, Josh Simmons on uh, redistricting in, in counties, towns, cities across the state, and look forward to answering any questions you might have and um, uh, working with uh, you in the future. And again, my apologies for the, the travel situation that caused my lateness. Hey, Jeff, thanks. You got on just in time, so you weren't okay. late at all, and we appreciate uh, uh, your... Before yeah. I was a before I was a lawyer, I was an advanced person in campaigns, so I learned how to balance and uh, uh, get out of the subway quickly. Yeah, no, great job, and we appreciate you taking the time. Okay. Now you did a great job unpacking that new law, but there are still some questions, and we're getting questions. We got questions as you spoke, um, so we're going to keep all those questions in 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 the queue and, and start to address them after the, our next pre presenter. Uh, Josh Simons, who works at the Benjamin Center. Um, uh, welcome, Josh. Thanks for being with us today. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure and an honor. So um, basically, I just want to go through uh, a little bit and talk about what does the actual redistricting process look like. So some of the things that are in my presentation are kind of retreads of the previous two presentations. So I'm going to kind of gloss over them. But uh, yeah, let's get started. Next slide. Okay, so what's redistricting? Uh, redistricting is basically redrawing the district boundaries so they have roughly the same population at, it, at its base, conforming to the one uh, person, one vote standard. Um, in overpopulated districts, each person's vote counts less than it should. In underpopulated districts, each person's vote counts more than it should. And there's a legally accepted standard of, vote, of how much inequality in population is acceptable. Next slide. So in a typical timeline, Laugh, laugh, laugh. Uh, the census is taken. January 21st, typically some local governments appoint uh, commissions that as early as that. The data was released by the census in April. The you know plans are developed, typically voted on uh, in 2022, and then in, sometime in 2023, the first elections are held with new plans. Next slide. This is not a typical cycle. So we've had delays in the data. Um, which have affected some counties with statutory deadlines. Most counties don't really have statutory deadlines, so that hasn't been such a big deal, except for the entire process is being compressed now. Uh, if that, that sort of uh, timeline with the 2023 election cycle uh, is to be adhered to. So, um, you know, it's, it's much like uh, planting a tree. When's the best time to plant a tree 30 years ago? When's the second best time now? Well, the best time to start thinking about redistricting was about three months ago, four months ago. The second best time to start thinking about redistricting is now. Next slide. So all redistricting is local. You know, um, if you 
you know, look in the, the, the news and things like that, there's a big focus on congressional redistricting and the sort of, you know, uh, things that play out there. Uh, but most of, of the redistricting that gets done is local redistricting and even congressional redistricting gets done at the state level. So in New York state, there's 40 counties, 16 towns, four villages, 47 cities, and at least one school district, these uh, Buffalo public schools that utilize district plans. And each and every one of them are going to have to evaluate their population changes. Next slide. So process drives outcome, right? The process could be defined in local law or in a county charter. There's independent commissions, there's committees, task force, et cetera. <clears throat> Statutory timelines may or may not exist. And, um, you know, so if you have, uh, regardless of, of what system is in place within the county, appointments informing the redistricting group comes first. So then there's a question of, should you hire a consultant? Well, maybe. Um, generally, hiring a consultant is because there's either technical skills that don't exist in-house or, for instance, utilizing the planning department could be seen as partisan because of uh, an executive legislative split. The legislatures are the ones that are conducting redistricting. There's not really a place for county executives in the redistricting process beyond the typical sort of political things that go on. Um, uh, so then there's the expertise in the legal requirements or, or just experience having done it before, familiars, familiarity with the data, the technologies, the processes, the requirements. The cons um, are that it costs money and that the, the RFP uh, selection can be time consuming and, and difficult. And so I, I think like when weighing whether a, a consultant should be hired or not, you know, a, a, a good look at, at what the capabilities, you know, are in-house. And also, I mean, it also depends on the resources that are given to the task of redistricting. Next slide. So I'm going to sk skip over these pretty much because we, we covered a lot of them. Um, so next slide. Okay, so priorities. Uh, Priorities basically um, determine, you know, the, the uh, what the redistricting plans are ultimately going to look like, and things that are put in a higher priority uh, affect your ability to 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 conform to lower priorities. And so, aside from the legal requirements, the a system of priorities um, should be developed, and and uh, and they matter. So that, those could be keeping municipalities whole or uh, geographic boundaries, river streams that act as natural dividers between communities, communities of interest, nesting districts such as school districts, state assemblies, state senate, wards of cities, et cetera, um, competition and partisanship, uh, you know, whether a, a map should start fresh or keep cores of the current districts intact, incumbent protection, um, and your ability to actually do some of this is going to be affected by this new state law uh, in terms of priorities. But, um, you know, oftentimes one of the things that keeping the cores of the district intact, uh, a lot of times uh, places that redistrict want to just tweak the boundaries of what they have in order to conform to the population standard, uh, et cetera. And I mean, that's that's fine. That's, so that's legally acceptable. But one of the, the byproducts of that is that any sort of political decisions that were made in redistricting past get inherited in the next cycle and the next cycle. And um, in places where this has been a regular practice for many, many decades, what you can see uh, is boundaries of districts that don't make any real rational sense and the institutional knowledge of why those decisions were made in the first place um, you know, are, are lost. Uh, for legislatures that are doing this, I know that it's uncomfortable because the, if the legislature is the, is the body that's doing the redistricting and not an independent commission, they've been elected from those districts and so want them to change as little as possible. But um, it's really an opportunity once a decade to actually, um, you know, to, to make boundaries conform to some kind of rational standard where maybe they haven't in the past. Next slide. So the district deviation and demographic statistics, like basically the first thing that, uh, that I would do would be that I would plug in the new, uh, the new redistricting numbers on a census block level. Um, oftentimes, uh, oftentimes elected officials think in terms of the election district level, but the election districts are drawn from the census blocks of the, of the uh, legislative districts after the redistricting process. And so the, exi the existing election districts right now don't conform to the 2020 census blocks if they were drawn on the 2010 census blocks. And there's also no real requirement 
that they um, conform to the census block boundaries, they are for the purposes of election administration. And so frequently election districts split election blocks and actually getting data at that level is not um, easy or even possible. But at the census block level, that's the most granular level that the, the data exists in. Um, so what I would do is I would plug in the, the numbers for the PL94171 census data and you know um, uh, for the 2020 blocks, redraw the districts based on those blocks. Also now the LAT four person or adjusted population data has been not only released but is now required. So I would use that data and I would rebuild the districts using the current shapes of the 2020 blocks and then calculate the populations of each district, the population deviation, and the voting age population demographic statistics. So that'll tell you which districts are out of compliance, um, uh, how much the population numbers have changed in the, in the 10 years, and how much the voting age population demographics of the districts have changed. Next slide. So afterwards, um, another thing that I would look at is, uh, is performing a Voting Rights Act test, and typically, uh, this is done um, in places with a high population density and a uh, sizable um, protected minority population. Um, so plans cannot diminish the protected minority's opportunity to elect a candidate of their choosing. Um, in many places, this issue has been well litigated over the years. In other places, not at all. Um, generally, like there are there are five tests uh, for the Voting Rights Act Section Two. The first test is is a simply a look at it and see can additional how many how many majority minority majority districts can be created so how many districts with a with a voting age population over 50 percent of the voting age population of the district can be created um, and if additional voting uh, hispan or if additional majority minority uh, districts can be created then it moves on to the next tests uh, which would determine whether they're required to be so this is a this is an undisclosed um, county legislative district right here, and if you look at the intersections of D2, D3, D and D4, there you can see that there is a there is a high population density and minority population that is split between uh, three different districts. That would raise some red flags in a Voting Rights Act test. Um, you know, uh, next slide. So drawing the redistricting plans is an iterative process. Um, you know, a consultant doesn't come in and say, this is the way that you should do it, and then you either accept it or don't accept it. Uh, you know, multiple plans can be worked on simultaneously because you have competing priorities. Um, ideally, what ends up happening is, is successive decisions drive the process towards a consensus. So um, and it, multiple maps are made each one is tweaked a little bit tweaked a little bit here tweaked a little bit there you know eventually hard decisions have to be made because everybody can't get what they want you know um, there are oftentimes things that are either either de desired uh, conflict with things that are required or multiple things that are desired conflict with one another you know and so ultimately the the decisions that are made and the plan that's put forth is developed uh, by the legislature or by the committee or the task force, whatever the, uh, or the commission, whatever the, the redistricting body is. Uh, and uh, the decision process needs to be driven towards something that everybody can live with. Next slide. So start to finish, the redistricting bodies formed, census data is released, district deviation demographic reports made, a voting rights, the first pass Voting Rights Act test is done. Initial plans are drawn, discussed, debated, decisions are made. Next uh, set of plans is drawn based on the above decisions. And then the, that iterates until a final plan is arrived at. There's a public hearing uh, or multiple public hearings. It's probably best to get as much public input in the process as possible. Uh, there's plan adoption. And then after the adopted plan, the Board of Elections draws new election districts in order to effectively administer elections within the new districts. Um, so next slide. Uh, that's it. Rock and roll. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Josh Simons from the Benjamin Center. And I just want to let the audience know that this has been recorded. Uh, so these, these slides are available. We're going to make the slides available and the recording available 
uh, to the entire NYSEC membership uh, later this afternoon. But some of those slides that Josh just covered really lay out the, you know, in a, in a clean and simple way, um, the process that a county can go through for, uh, for, for doing this. Not that the process is simple, but he laid out a simple plan for doing that. So thank you, Josh. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle some of the the, um, the questions. The first one I'm gonna tackle, and maybe Josh, you can answer this: is Does this redistricting have to be done for the next set of elections? So for those um, those elections that are scheduled, local elections that are scheduled for 2022, does this process need to be completed by then? Um, I mean, typically no. Uh, it would it would depend. Many places, some places have their own statutory um, uh, sort of requirements within the county charter, within local laws as to when a new plan needs to be enacted. Um, for places that don't, then generally I would say for the 2022 elections, no, probably not, but they should be shooting to be able to have a plan in place for the 2023 elections. Okay, great, thank you very much. Dr. <clears throat> Benjamin spoke on weighted voting for boards of supervisors. And, and there are some boards of legislatures, legislators and counties. Um, is weighted voting acceptable for a county legislature also? The answer is yes, you can. Uh... then uh, put a weighted voting system in. Okay. Um, and th and thank you. In, uh, uh, reference to the earlier question, the longer you wait to implement uh, redistricting, the higher the risk, because uh, you might be, it might be alleged that you're purposely putting off redistricting to avoid some partisan consequence or some undesired political consequence. And uh, so you have, there's some, uh, Litigation risk. I don't think it's major, but it, it there is some. Thanks for pointing that out. Thank you. Um, we were told by our legislative clerk that in the recent legislative clerk, clerk conference, they were told that they that we that counties need to move away from weighted votes in our redistricting plans for 2021-22. Can you help clarify? Uh, uh to my I, knowledge, there is no requirement. I haven't encountered that. The only thing that, I, that has occurred to me is if you over time, if you have a concentrated minority population in a town that has never been able to uh, affect, have effective choice because the weighted voting scheme doesn't, doesn't reflect the change in the character of the population rather than the number of the people, you might have a problem. So the composition of the population, racially, ethnically, et cetera, is not considered in way, has not till now been considered in waiting voting that I know of. And this, so there might be some risk there, but I can't think of other, there's always the, the ongoing uh, potential of some, lawsuit in one county uh, opening up, reopening the question of, of weighted voting, but I don't see it as a major, that is a major risk. The character and uh, the character of the population may however bring into question a weighted voting scheme. Thank you, that's a good answer. And uh, what's the process for updating weighted voting formula, the A weighted voting formula? And Josh just spelled out the, the process for redistricting. Uh, is it the same process for weighted voting, and is there is the this a committee of the board of supervisors, the chairman, or some other configuration? Generally, counties have hired a consultant who uh, tells them what who who does who runs does some formulas, and I can give references to the formulas and how they can be applied. I don't think you have to be a PhD in math to do it, although a lot of counties rely on PhDs in math to do it. And then uh, the, the, the consultant makes recommendations or a recommendation about a weighted voting or option or a set of weighted alternative weighted voting options or an option. And then the board acts on those recommendations. It's less 
uh, much less structured than uh, redistricting processes that are uh, um, more identified by the public in areas of political or political uh, advantage and bias might be introduced or racial racial bias may be introduced, but it's a, it's a less formalized process, relies upon expertise, external expertise, which not only makes the recommendations, but validates them, says it, you know, this is in accord with the law. It's not a guarantee, but it's a validation that helps with the uh, adoption. Okay, so we have two other questions. Just to follow up on that, uh, Jerry, we have two other questions on um, is there a service or a vendor or a consultant uh, that will help calculate the weighted vote for a county with a board of supervisors? So um, I, I think the Benjamin Center does that. Are there other entities out there that, that does similar uh, one consulting of them, services? There was one person who did it for a number of counties who passed away recently. So that opened up the question again. But I think we can do it or uh, any, uh, if you don't want to do it, with us or a not-for-profit, you, and you have a community college uh, in your in your county, or or a SUNY campus, or a private college with a math department, you can approach the math department with that question. I think you could find easily find expertise. But if you want uh, people who actually have done it or are doing it, we are among a, a number of not-for-profits that do it. Not-for-profit think tanks that do it. Great, thank you. Uh, Jeff, are you still with us? Jeff, I'm are still you here. Us? Okay, yes. so um, you talked about the new law, and we have a question about, um, can you highlight the, the major or main differences between the old law and the new law? Well, the major difference is the population uh, requirement that districts be within 5% from the size of the largest to smallest district, uh, as opposed to the you know, the 10% uh, standard that's been generally used across the country. Uh, and then the, uh, the law also you know, um, puts you really on warning in terms of any litigation challenge that if you can demonstrate that a plan unfairly uh, favors or disfavors a political party or a specific candidate, or that districts were not as compact as they could be. Uh, it sets up basically uh, you know, the need for each county to follow the criteria and, ex and be able to explain how they followed the criteria in the prioritized ranking that I went through. Uh, you know, prior to um, uh, this law, uh, you, know, you could not really bring a challenge against you know, what we call partisan gerrymandering. Uh, favoring or disfavoring a political party. Uh, now state courts you know, can hear those kinds of claims. So it really puts everybody in a different mindset that you've got to follow these criteria. And again, I'd be glad to uh, work with anybody one-on-one -on -one to uh, look at your current county charter, uh, your current um, legislature, and some ideas on where you need to go uh, north, south, east, or west on this. I have something I want to say about this, if I may, please. If I may. The, the, uh, the people passage of a state law that uh, that preempts the suspect under home rule. I'd like to be involved in a case like that because I think the state can't do it. The state constitution. Especially the governance portions of that article. I think the first subsection or the second subsection. Yeah, I, I think this that. is going to be challenged. I think it's going to be challenged. I, 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 um, it's very provocative under under home rule. It very is, and, it, and we, you and I have talked about this, but we, we, that this could be a topic of an, another conversation. We have a number of uh, other if questions. I could also just mention uh, the U.S. Supreme Court in 2019 closed the door to federal courts hearing any partisan gerrymandering claims and suggested that state courts uh, be the place to adjudicate partisan issues. So um, part of the door here is opened by this new law and part of the door is opened by the U.S. Supreme Court's 
a suggestion that litigants go to state courts. Um, Jeff, is the the new law is that effective immediately? So as soon as uh, as as counties are doing this, yes, uh, the effective clause was uh, that the bill the law shall go into effect immediately. Okay, thank you. Um, could someone explain the 110% limit to split within towns? Uh, Josh, do you want to give that a go? Yeah, I mean, basically what you would do is you would calculate the ideal population by taking the population of the county and dividing it by the number of legislative districts that you have. That'll give you a number for sake of argument. Let's just say that it's uh, it's 50,000. What the 110 percent would mean is that if a town population is less than 55,000 people, then it can't be split. And if it's over 55,000 people, then it's OK. to split. And that's that's essentially the, the, the basis of it, I believe. But okay. now the, the standard is 40 uh, percent for uh, municipalities within a county. So that would that would you know that lowers it considerably. So in that in, in that instance, we'd be talking about you know if each if each was supposed to be fifty thousand uh, you know people, then what is it uh, if it's if it has uh, more than thirty thousand people, it'd be able to be split. Okay, great, thank you. The last sentence of the new law says, to the extent practicable. No villages, cities, or towns except those having more than 40% of a full ratio for each district shall be divided. What does full ratio for each district mean? I think you kind of got to that, but it's another way of asking the question. Yeah, so it just basically means that if the uh, population of a town, village, or city uh, is less than 40% of the uh, ideal population plus or minus the deviation, I believe, then it, it couldn't be split. How is the counting of inmates to be done at this time? I, I... The, uh, the lab for um, the Legislative Task Force for Redistricting released a data set which attempts to um, basically take the prisoner populations of the, the actual populations of the prisoners that are in the census blocks that the prisons are in and redistribute them to their um, address at the time of their arrest. Uh, so if you have a prison that has uh, a thousand um, prisoners, that census block would no longer have a population of 1,000 and the Department of Corrections data is used to redistribute those thousand people to the census blocks where, where they uh, were from at the time of their arrest. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, does chapter, uh, the new law, chapter 516, only deal with county charters? In other words, does the new 5% rule also potentially override provisions of the city charter? That's a Jeff question. That is a Jeff question, okay. Let me unmute Jeff, who's on the subway. The law is intended to apply to all municipalities across the state. It's in the fine, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the language that refers back to the municipal home rule law, uh, else, existing law elsewhere. So uh, Paul and his scoopers wanted to make sure that all governments in the state were subject to the 5% maximum deviation cap. Thank you. Um, and one questioner asked uh, about the contra contradiction of the percentage of population from one speaker to another, and I think that's the one ten percent versus the forty percent. And the the new law is the forty percent. Is that correct? That's correct. That that is correct. Where review of the census data makes clear a county has to redistrict, but there is no deadline in the county's charter or the county's code, is there some other authority that mandates when redistricting has to be completed? Uh, I could give that a go. Am I live? Yes. Uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court in the 1964 case of Reynolds versus Sims 
indicated that a redrawing of district boundaries once every 10 years is reasonable, uh, and generally after the decennial census is taken and before the next election uh, gets underway. Uh, so that's the, the, the 10 year redistricting requirement comes from that basic decision. Uh, now, just also point out, if your current districts do not, um, uh, are not in, in excess of that 5% overall limit, you don't necessarily have to redistrict, you can redistrict, but you must redistrict if your current boundaries are out of proportion with the overall 5% uh, window. When I, when I drew the redistricting, uh, proposed the redistricting article for the Ulster County Charter, it was the second odd numbered year in the decennium because the first one was too soon, we couldn't get it ready, and the second one was yeah, I, I would say, election year after the de beginning of the decennium. Yeah, I would suggest as a rule of thumb that if your districts are in excess of 5% overall deviation, and you have elections in 2023 uh, that you have your lines drawn in time for uh, the spring primary uh, next year uh, in 2023. How should redistricting proceed if there's evidence of errors in the PL 94171 counts and the census count question resolution will be filed? Okay. The, uh, the census count resolution program is entirely separate and apart from the PL 94171 uh, data. So the PL 94171 data basically uh, does not get changed while the uh, the count resolution challenges you know can uh, make a difference numbers can change but that's used for for your economic business and other kinds of government planning purposes but not for redistricting the PL94 171 data is pretty much locked in if you have specific problems with it or questions you know I'd be glad to uh, work with some experts or with Josh um, you know, we we can look to see with you what those problems are, but you really don't have any recourse with the PL94-171 data, although you, you, know, you, you might be able to adjust the data, uh, which is a whole other complicated question that we could get into offline. Uh, Jeff, that's not actually been my experience. Uh, my experience in this is that I know that, for instance, the city of Oneonta filed a, uh, a CQR um, and actually used the CQR resolution within their own redistricting. Well, okay, the, uh, you, know, you, you are correct. The PL94-171 data itself doesn't get changed, but you are, that's what I was alluding to, that if you have better data and can document it, you can probably use that other data. Yeah, they, they held off on actually using it until, this, until the resolution had occurred. But once the census had accepted the changes that they had suggest based on, it had to do with the dormitories at, at uh, SUNY Oconomica. Right, Oconomica. yeah, but this is the where- the Census Bureau had accepted the changes, they then used the changes within their own redistricting. Right, this is where we get into the weeds on it, that uh, adjustments can be made, but not at the federal level, you can make it at the local level. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. We're at 11.12. I'm going to take two more questions, uh, and, and then we will try to get back to everybody with other questions that we're not able to get to. Uh, but the first one is, is for uh, Jeff. Uh, I think it's for Jeff, and it's about the ranking of the criteria. Uh, the new law has the, the, the specific criteria that needs to be considered. How should that criteria be ranked? Well, uh, I showed you in my slide the, the way they were ranked. I don't have it in front of me again right now, but essentially you had um, population equality, minority voting rights, compactness, contiguity, and then there were a few others. But the slide I showed you, um, you know, ranked, if, if you go back, to take a look, a few more slides. Um, yeah, here are, you know, one more slide, I think. Um, yeah, go now forward again. I'm sorry. Yeah, here's the criteria. So you've got population equality, uh, minority voting rights, contiguity, compactness, uh, not favoring or disfavoring incumbents, parties, or candidates, 
uh, looking at existing cores of districts, communities of interest, and then your locality uh, limits. Are those listed by priority order then? These are in the bill. That's where I got these from, in the law. Great, thank you. So the next, uh, the last question has to do with weighted voting. Um, and, and then um, it's multi-part. Does the Benjamin Center charge for doing an update to a county's weighted voting system? Uh, what are the advantage of a county using a weighted voting system? And are there, uh, could, uh, we could use the formulas for weighted voting so we can do this in-house. So that's a multi-pronged question for either Josh or Jerry. Well, the answer is yes, we, we charge a fee based upon the amount of work that we, we anticipate doing. That's number one. Number two, um, you could do it yourself, and I think you could find people in the county who could do it. Third, the advantages of weighted voting system. The, the advantage is that you have the constituent districts in quotation marks are towns. So you're not creating new boundaries, which tends to make the local government system more complex and tends to be complicated for voters. The complicating for voters diminishes accountability. Also, the, uh, the town supervisors are governing the county. The relationship between the town and the county in governance of both is much stronger than in a legislative system. I was in office for 12 years under a legislative system and visited the town. We had multi towns in each district we, uh, to meet federal criteria. When I visited town boards, which was my practice of doing a couple times a year, I found that most town officials were not informed about what the county was up to. So there's, I think, a tighter relationship, better relationship, tighter governance. So that's the main purpose of uh, weighted voting is uh, relationship in governance, be achieving, avoiding unnecessary complexity and achieving a strong relationship in governance between towns and counties. And with that, I, I will, uh, I'm gonna close down the question, a portion of this uh, presentation. I thank you all for joining us. There are about uh, six or seven questions that we were not able to get to, uh, but we will be asking our presenters to answer those questions and we will disseminate them by email to all uh, participants on this webinar. Thank you for your time. I want to especially thank the speakers uh, today for, for their expertise and their knowledge in working with our counties. And I want to also thank NTS Data Services for sponsoring today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone.